you ever stop to consider what your happiness depends on, what your sense of well-being depends on? Usually depends on a certain level of certain level of wealth, enough money to get by, however you would define getting by. It depends on certain people. It depends on the health of the body. All kinds of things that when you really stop to think about it are really unstable and uncertain. This is what the Buddha noticed and said, we've got to find something else. It's when he talked about the noble search. that. If you yourself are subject to aging, illness, and death, and you look for your happiness in things that are subject to aging, illness, and death, well, there's really no security there. It's an investment that doesn't really pay off. So you've got to look someplace else. This is why we meditate. Because as I said, true happiness comes from a mind that's trained. That's an important statement. This doesn't come out of the mind as it is. Some people say, we look inside and there it is, true happiness. Well, it's not the case. You've got to train the mind. Because the mind has a tendency just to grab hold of things. It's always feeding on this, feeding on that. And that's what you've got to deal with. That's what you've got to solve. That's the habit that you've got to outgrow through the training. Because on the one hand, you give it better things to feed on inside. As you develop qualities of alertness, mindfulness, concentration, the sense of ease and well-being that come when the mind can finally settle down and just feel at home inside. And at the same time, you have to reflect on the things that you have been depending on, that you have based your happiness on. Now, the Buddha doesn't say just throw them away, because in many cases we have to live. We still have to live in the world. We still have bodies. You can't throw your body away. We live with other people whom we love. Our food, clothing, shelter, medicine depend on the economy functioning properly. So the question is, how do you live with these things without making your, depend your happiness depend on them? That's the trick. And it comes down to this question of the mind's feeding habits. How do you feed on your relationships? How do you feed on the body being a certain way? How do you feed on material things, status, whatever? That's something we each have to reflect on. One way of reflecting is to imagine yourself suddenly deprived of those things. How would your mind handle that situation? Would you have the inner resources to fall back on if those things had to change. If you can't even think about the topic, okay, then that's a sign that you've really got some inner work to do. And then as you do the inner work, you, you try to get more and more de centered in here. Your center of gravity should shift. For most people, their center of gravity is someplace outside. You want to bring it inside. As long as the mind has to feed, let it feed on the sense of ease, that sense of well-being that comes from the meditation. This, of course, is going to require that you get skillful at the meditation, so that it's there when you need it, and you're not just shooting arrows into the dark. So this is why the Buddha has that reflection we chanted this morning, subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to that, subject to separation, because these things are all around us. We don't like to think about them, but the fact of our not thinking about them doesn't make them go away. They're always going to come, one way or another. So the question is, how can you maintain your sense of well-being in the midst of a world where well-being is always being stripped away? Sometimes they say, well, try to get get a sense of interconnectedness with other being. Our suffering is because we feel so separated. 
you felt more interconnected, that would be okay. Well, what are you getting interconnected with? Very unstable systems. You look at the weather. We've been having very good weather here in California, in San Diego for the past summer, but in the Midwest it's been awfully hot. Heat waves all over the place. It's all part of the same system. This year it's working for us, but the same system is causing trouble for other people. This is why the Buddha never said that people are separate, never said that they're one. The fact that they're interconnected, though, says that it's, everything is very unstable. There's no system in the world that benefits everybody. And that in, in itself is enough to want you to make you get out of the world. Because your well-being depends on somebody else's suffering someplace. Sometimes their well-being is going to depend on your suffering. And the fact that we're all interconnected this way doesn't make it better. Actually, it makes it more scary. There's got to be a way out. If there's no way out, we're really stuck. John Sowett was once asked why Buddhism didn't have a god. The person said it would be a lot easier when you're meditating if you felt you had a god to fall back on when things are going bad. And John Sowett's response was, well, if there's a god who can make it so that if I eat a spoonful of food, everybody else gets full, in addition to me. Okay, he would bow down to that god. And if really we're one, okay, one, if one person gets full, everybody gets full. One person benefits, everybody benefits. But it's not that way at all. It's all very unstable. A lot of inequalities. A lot of feeding going on. This person feeds on that person, that person feeds on this person. Sometimes the feeding is mutually beneficial, sometimes it's harmful for both. Sometimes it favors only one side. It's kind of the emotional food chain in the world, in addition to the economic and other food chains. And even when things are going well for you, it's only relative, relatively well. When we talk about the health of the body, it means, okay, that's nothing more than just plain old hunger and thirst. That's bad enough right there. The need for food, the need for clothing, the need for shelter, that never ends. We're born with this gaping hole. It just needs to have all the stuff stuffed into it. And we're also born dependent on other people. We depend on our parents. As we grow older, we start depending on our friends. And again, that dependency, there's a lot of emotional ties, but at the same time, okay, there's separation is going to have to happen. And before this separation, is going to be aging, illness, and death. So the question is, how can you live in a world which is filled with this suffering, and at the same time maintain your inner sense of well-being? That's what the skill of the meditation is all about. We have to be very clear about the way the world is. Because otherwise we start getting deluded. And we forget the importance of the training. Because an untrained mind just goes out and gobbles down everything. Good, bad, indifferent, whatever. It just takes it in. And of course it's going to suffer. We have to be very particular in where we base our happiness, where our true sense of well-being lies. So last week I was reading about someone who was complaining about one of the Buddhist sutras where there's a monk who's going to go out to a foreign land where people are rough. And the Buddha says, those people are pretty rough. Are you, are you prepared for what they might do to you? He says, what are you going to do if they hit you? Excuse me, first you start that. What are they going to do if they yell at you? And the, man, and the monk says, well, be, say these people are very good and they're not hitting me. The Buddha says, what if they hit you? He says, well, at least they're not throwing stones at me. What if they throw stones at you? At least they're not stabbing me. What if they're stabbing you? So at least they're not killing me. What if they kill you? What will you think? 
the monk says, well, there have been other people who've died because they committed suicide. At least my death isn't going to be a suicide. And the Buddha says, good, you're ready to go. And the person who was reading this story is complaining. It sounded awfully life-denying, they said. But I think the good message that the Buddhism has, that the Buddhist teachings has, is that there's something that's more valuable than life itself. And that's the happiness that the mind can develop using its own powers of ingenuity, its own powers of discernment. Because if the most important thing in the world were life, okay, life is going to end. And then where are you going to be? The message here, though, is that okay, life ends, it doesn't really matter. There's still good things left. There's still the qualities you've built into the mind. And it's important to maintain those qualities. Like the monk in the story, he's prepared to deal with any situation that comes up, even death, by making sure that his mind isn't affected by these things, doesn't give in to greed, doesn't give in to anger, doesn't give in to regret, attachment. You can maintain the mind in that state. Okay, you've got a great treasure right there. That can be the basis for your happiness. And so you can live in the world and still deal with the issues of the world, still love your, your relatives, love the people you, you're close to. But there's something separate inside, which is your own treasure. Each of us has his or her own. And it's an area of the mind that nobody else can ever know about. And John Lee once said that those are the only things that are really safe, because other people know about it. They might find some way of taking it away. But it's a part of the mind that's totally personal. And as you develop that inner sense of independence, totally private, totally personal, you're not the only one who benefits. The people around you benefit as well. It's not a selfish goal. It's not an anti-social goal. It's actually because of this inner sense of well-being that you can function properly in the world. Because you no longer have to feed on the people around you. You have enough of your own inner food and enough to offer to others as well. In a way that benefits everyone. So it's important to reflect, and the Buddha keeps focusing our attention on the sorrows and the sufferings of the world, not because he wants us to get depressed or pessimistic, but just say, okay, look, you've got to look someplace else for your happiness. And there is another place to look through developing these good, skillful qualities of the mind that we're working on here right now. It's kind of like a carrot and a stick. The carrot is a sense of well-being that you develop as you, the mind begins to settle down and settles down to deeper and deeper stages of awareness, deeper and deeper stages of sort of oneness, wholeness inside. The stick is to remind you, okay, if you don't have this, if you don't work at this, things can get pretty bad out there. Like instead of the, the gentle earthquake we had right now, we could have had a you know, 9.5 Richter. All kinds of things are possible out there. So I have a very strong sense both of the dangers that lie if you try to base your happiness outside and of the true security that comes as you develop these skillful qualities in the mind.